Ron, Ron John Roy. He's the vice president of strategy at Adormi, and uh, he's going to talk us talk to us about how they're using influencers. So, welcome, Ron John. Thank you for having me. Hey, I have to ask: Are those just for show, or do you actually play them? <laughs> I do play. I do play, but uh, they make for a nice Zoom background as well. I found. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I'm going to let you take it away and do your bit, and then I'll come back on and we'll uh, have some questions for you. All right, perfect. Um, is the deck up? Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so I'm Ranjan Roy. I'm the VP of strategy at Adormi. We are a women's wear direct to consumer brand. We started selling bras and laundry in 2011 and now sell across a number of categories, sleep, swim, um, ready to wear, active wear. Um, we run the gamut. But today, what I want to talk to you about is our creators platform. And it's our unique approach towards influencer marketing. And we started, it started as a small experiment in a, towards the end of 2019. And it's actually grown into something that we think can be something much, much bigger. Next slide, please. Um, so 2017 to 2019, we, like every other DTC brand, especially in the fashion space, started thinking a lot about influencer marketing. Um, and we kind of took the approach like a traditional marketing, um, you know, we were structuring it like a talent agency. We brought someone on with experience more on the talent management side. And the idea was, you know, this would be our little in-house talent agency. We would hire, you know, people with hundreds and thousands, if not millions of followers, you know, strike through, you know, complex contracts and negotiate heavily and bring on kind of really prominent brand ambassadors. And I would say this period was also when everyone was kind of trying to start to figure it out and just, you know, throwing everything you could against the wall. But also at the same time, we started to get a lot of outreach from micro influencers, from smaller influencers, you know, some who are just kind of fans of the product and our brand, some who were trying to become kind of like move on their way towards actually building a career in the influencer space. Now, what would happen is we obviously, someone comes to you with five 10K followers, but really likes your brand, you want to work with them. They should be the most, you know, like dynamic of supporters of your brand. But we had what we called email ping pong. Um, and being a somewhat kind of like nerdy data driven company, we actually went back through when we were originally conceiving of this product. And we were trying to figure out, okay, how many emails on average does it take to kind of like structure a very simple contract with an influencer, even something like a, a $250 payment for one or post, how many emails? And actually it took 5.7 emails. So we realized just from an internal resource allocation standpoint, it wasn't, we couldn't bring on as many influencers, as many people who wanted to work with us and we wanted to work with we were unable to actually make that work. Next slide, please. So enter creators. So it started in, uh, in a very kind of lean software development uh, mindset. It started as an experiment. We said, you know, let's, let's just kind of bring on some people and see if we structure this campaign, if we say, if we don't tell them what to do, if we just say, here's a very loosely structured campaign with very loose creative direction, um, what will they do? Um, and from there, we started doing experiments like this and the content was actually pretty amazing. And everyone was very happy with how it was working. So we started to build a platform and the platform, the way it works is, an influencer applies, sign up, they can connect their Instagram account. Now um, you, you can also sign up with your email. And there's a very brief questionnaire and then there's a very brief human vetting process. We don't exclude anyone based on, you know, we don't think this person is cool enough or looks a certain way. It's just more the human vetting process just for kind of like safety purposes. Um, but a typical campaign is something like this. We actually, we released this new line of clothing. It's a cooling fabric. Um, so it's called Breathe Deeply would be the example of the campaign here. Someone signs up, they have connected their Instagram account. 
all within our platform. They can upload their photos. It will auto post to Instagram. And the moment they post, they will, uh, they just, I use a certain hashtag and a, they tag a dormy and they will automatically gener be generated a $150 gift card. And again, this is all the direction, you know, you can see there's a little bit of a story. Now we're getting back to life. We can breathe a little. Here's some kind of inspiration pictures we like, but that's it. And from there, you know, we've, we've started with Instagram. We've expanded to TikTok, to YouTube. We've even run kind of political campaigns around re voter registration last year. Um, so it's turned into this amazing community. Next slide, please. So, Again, we have 2,800 creators who've signed up. We have, in, in the last 30 days, we've had over 1,500 creators take part in a campaign. Um, just 9,000 photos uploaded in the last month. Now we're on YouTube and TikTok. To date, lifetime, we've had over 50 million impressions all from this platform. And most importantly, we still work with a traditional influencer agency and we have found creators content has a 47% higher engagement rate than traditional agency influencer content. And again, that's as calculated by Facebook's engagement uh, metrics. And it makes sense in a way. Again, you have small communities with very kind of targeted interests where they trust the person on the other side. And that person, what we've found is, you know, when a gift card is the payment, you have to like our brand, you know, you're not going to go sign up for a brand and try to earn merch if you're not actually connected to that brand in some way. So we really find that, you know, both at a scaling level, this has actually turned into something really interesting, you know, kind of building this very active burgeoning community of people who we support them, they support us. Um, and again, it just, it, creates amazing content and that especially from a marketing perspective finding you know the right influencers finding the right content can be so difficult and especially allowing people to be creative allowing people to be creative enough without restricting them but also you know worrying about your own brand guidelines it's actually i would say one of the most amazing realizations is that you can be very loose about this and you know give people freedom and they actually will respond in a very positive way. Next slide, please. All right, so this is one of my favorite, I still kind of like probably scared everyone I work with because I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, this is so perfect because we about two years ago had a big rebrand and uh, you know, from there, we have a tagline here for it, everything. We really kind of like structured language around our brand being there to be supportive, being there to be, you know, not tell you what to do in your lingerie, but just be there to support you in any way we can. But like, I'm sure anyone watching, rebranding, branding, all these exercises are tough because you do all this work internally, but how do you know how people receive your brand? And again, there's the, so the, if you know the famous quote, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room, which I found out was Jeff Bezos while doing this. Of course, he even has marketing genius on top of everything else. Um, but, but this, so again, we very loose direction and this influencer, Alyssa R. King, and for note, she had never done any kind of like bra underwear oriented photography. She actually mostly does like illustrations and cosplay, but she writes, you know, it, this made me feel supported. I was very nervous about this, but you know, like in this process, I actually was so excited and now I feel confident to take these photos and that to us, we are all like that captured the brand, all the hard work, all the different people, the way we write on social, the way we even structure our e-com photography, everything. You can see it, it's working. That someone like kind of, you know, responds with that same message that you are hoping they would. And in fact, you know, we it's come where now we realize the creator's platform in a way works as this testing ground because when you don't tell people what to say, you find out what they say. So even testing new products, seeing how people respond, it's, it's been this amazing community. 
Next slide, please. And you know, we've even extended it to in, in a number of different ways. Uh, last year we did this again, it was this we partnered with headcount.org to drive voter registrations. Uh, we just did a campaign for International Women's Day. We did a ca campaign for Black History Month. A and again, like we've the interesting thing is we've moved beyond our products even in these campaigns. Um, like, you know, a lot of the campaigns now, you, we don't even ask you to wear an Adormi product necessarily. We just ask you to post, talk about how you feel about a certain thing. And, uh, you know, still you, you post, we will generate the gift card. So we've realized having this community of people who are very connected to your brand in a very meaningful way, having people who are, you know, micro influencers, nano influencers, who you who genuinely are you know trying to make great content who don't have that kind of celebrity ish level of you know approach to social media who just want to you know grow their communities connect with their communities it's a very very powerful thing to have you know within your brand's uh, ecosystem and you know, we realized technology can play a part in this in that we built this, it's a software product in the end. Um, it's enabled by, you know, connecting to the Instagram API, the YouTube API, bringing back analytics to our side, giving, we give dashboards to the creator so they can actually monitor their own analytics. Like, I can tell you, there's a lot of little quirks along the way in building the platform, but once it achieves a certain scale and once you see the power of it, it's a really important thing for us in terms of how we think in the future of influencer marketing, marketing could look like. So I think that's it. That was great. And um, I mean, I, I want to ask though, because a lot of it with influencers, I think a lot of difficulties that people have when they're using influencers is really being able to attribute it to anything, you know, in terms of it's obviously it's very much a part of brand awareness, but what are your measurement? What are your KPIs that you're looking at um, that's most important to you to show their value? Yeah, but that's a great question, Lisa. And, and I can tell you again, if, even in that kind of like 2017 to 2019 period of, you know, bigger budget influencer efforts, trying to decide, you know, like we could, we've, pretty robust uh, analytic systems and trying to, you know, dry, like monitor sales directly, you know, is something you can do. But we try to take the look at this from much more of a branding perspective. And, you know, evaluate these things in terms of traditional social metrics, engagement, you know, reach. But also, I mean, there is an editorial element where just at a very you know human level, our marketing team sits around and sometimes we're like, oh my God, did you see this post from this influencer? And then what actually we'll, we will do often is develop a more professional relationship with them. You know, reach out to them, maybe do a bigger budget, actual paid effort, you know, not gift cards, but actually a more contractual effort. Um, so we definitely will do that. But then also, I mean, always watching the engagement side of things, what posts spark conversations, what posts, uh, you know, generate things beyond simple likes or reels views or simple views. And also trying to have some sense of the qualitative side of that engagement. Again, just keeping a general eye on comment threads. Are there interesting things? From a technology side, given we have a lot of engineers, everyone is really interested in how to use natural language processing to actually like, you know, evaluate comments at scale and these kind of things. But, but at the moment, that side remains more qualitative, but still um, it's a evaluating these things still within the realm of traditional social metrics. Well, and I want to ask one more thing before, but I want to remind everyone that if you do have a question, put it in the chat box or raise your hand and I will um, unmute you. So we want to hear from you if you have any questions for um, Ranjan. But when you talk about also, you know, it helped you, you listened to what people were saying and then you could create new products. And But what about for the other, you have sister um, companies within your brand? Are you able to then extend it beyond just for the Adore Me people. Yep, so for context, um, we have currently nine, what we call sister brands. 
um, kind of smaller brands, you, each one for the most part, we try to like test out and work with partners, different sustainability or femtech innovations. So actually the campaign I had shown above is there is a, it's a thermo regulatory tech uh, fabric that was originally made for menopausal women to control hot flashes. But now, uh, I mean, we sell to women of all ages and that it's called Colibrium. And that actually is an example of, we, we use the creators community to one, from a marketing messaging standpoint, see what resonates, you know? And again, as I had said, we give this loose direction. Do people use the words like thermoregulatory technology? Do they use the word cooling in their own posts? Do they say this helped me sleep better is one thing we found out already from this campaign. Um, so really from a marketing messaging standpoint, it helps, especially as we're introducing new brands and even more importantly, as we're introducing new fabric innovations and technologies to the market, it plays a huge role. And again, we, we, it's, we kind of, someone had said, it's kind of this like, evolution of the focus group. Because if you think about it, a focus group is people sitting around, you show them something, and then they tell you back what they think or see. Here's a situation where we tell someone something and then they go, like almost the game of telephone, they go to and tell another group of people what they interpreted, what they took away from that. And we find, again, that has incredible marketing, brand and a brand analysis value. Okay, well, we do have a question from Sarah. Um, do you have plans on sharing out how you set up your internal influencer dashboard? Uh, it almost feels like an MLM play. Did you take any influence from their strategies? Um, so I meaning, in, or I guess in terms of the dashboards, we, there's, I guess, two parts of this. From our own side, again, it's actually been very helpful for us because even in terms of thinking how we monitor our own social analytics, um, in terms of the influencers themselves, we actually have found this to be a really interesting thing that we are thinking about kind of from a software perspective. Right now, there's social and influencer analytics tools at the higher end. You can pay like $100, $300 a month, but there's nothing for much smaller influencers, simply to give them a better understanding of how they're performing themselves. So we have wondered, you know, like uh, simply honestly giving like a simple dashboard showing here's your reach, here's your engagement beyond them looking at their own posts and seeing how many likes they got, people found very helpful and have already responded. They'd like to get more data and analytics like that. So we, there's definitely been talk about how to kind of make those dashboards robust for influencers themselves as a kind of extra value added to the platform for them. Okay, and one other question. Um, is it interesting that you did not go with social media platform instead decided to build one? So for a company, a brand that doesn't have that kind of tech resource, what would you suggest? What's the next best thing? Um, well, we have actually started working with a couple of external, uh, we are, we're thinking about, you know, how to bring on external brands or even open sourcing the technology potentially. Um, but it, I, I really think the way to think about these things is, is to do small experiments. Again, like if you want to build a more deeply engaged, uh, relationship with your influencer community, technology drives it, but still it starts with simply reaching out and asking and saying, you know, like here, would you like to go, you know, promote this message? How would you promote this message? What's some kind of campaign that you would like to, you know, take part in? And, and I really think it starts with before getting to the technology side of it, really starting to think at that personal level, what are small experiments I can do to, uh, to help try to build out these communities? And again, look at these communities not as a transactional one-off, you're gonna do this campaign, I'm gonna pay you X. Look at it as a community that you can learn from, that they can learn from you and you can all grow together. That's great. No, and I, I'm just talking, I mean, obviously with you, but other people that I've spoken with, they're really finding that real fan. It seems to be a lot more valuable and much more, you know, specific targeting capability. So 
So, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Ron John, for you being here and sharing that all with us. And that was a great presentation. Thanks. All right. Thank you for having me.